You're listening to the Think, Live, Repeat podcast, a place for people who are looking for simple and actionable ways to bring their lives to the next level. I'm your host, John Skomsky, and I want you to get ready for some amazing conversations as we dive deep into the minds of successful people, how they think intentionally and live differently. There's just two simple rules. Change doesn't have to be complicated, and change begins with your mind. You literally possess the power to change the direction of your life. So consider yourself warned. If you're not ready to start growing today, you might just want to turn this off now before it's too late. What's up, Inward Investors? It's another edition of the Think Live Repeat podcast. I'm glad you joined us. I, I was trying to figure out a way to, to launch into this and, and capture some of the unique moments, but I'm, I, I'm going to go with this. He holds a record, at least since I last checked, of riding a unicycle off a cliff and bungee jumping. Uh, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that is correct. Man, you did, you did your research. You poked around I quite a bit. <laughs> yes. So, you know, when anytime you get an opportunity to talk to someone who's done that, you know good things are coming. So today's guest is Jeff Savilico. Jeff, so glad you joined us. Uh, it's great to be here, John. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm, that's hilarious that you found that. It feels like a lifetime ago. I was in my 20s. Uh, on cruise ships, had some time and uh, decided to do something a little crazy. I was in New Zealand. I had my unicycle with me. People were riding bicycles off of this bungee jump. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to ride my unicycle off. So they taped my feet to the pedals, which probably was the, uh, you know, wasn't the safest thing to do. Uh, hooked up a couple carabiners, strapped me in and uh, sent me off. I don't even know if I signed a waiver, to be honest, but... <laughs> <laughs> and you live to tell, and you got a record, so obviously it was worth it. Just a massive wedgie, but yeah, it's totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can probably guess, uh, Jeff's a funny guy too. So he is—he's uh, many things. We're going to dig into this today, but you know, you—you you juggle, you ride a unicycle, you're a comedy, you're, you, you're a comic, you have a charity, you headlined in, in Vegas for a decade. There's there's so much here to unpack, but where I guess I'd like to start is where did you? Kind of, how did you decide that that entertainment was going to be like your focus? Like, were you the guy that was like five years old, mm. you know, making your parents laugh, kind of thing? And it was like destiny. Did you have this moment? You idolized Eddie Murphy, somebody? I don't know. You're just like, I got to be that. Like, what was it that got you on this trajectory? So, as a kid, I was picked to be a volunteer when I was about ten years old. My oldest brother went to Harvard. We were visiting Harvard Square on a family trip, and a street performer who went by the name of Peter Panic, which always thought was kind of funny dressed in all green he juggled dangerous items called himself peter panic he chose me to be a volunteer i did a little trick with a spinning plate and it sounds cheesy but i can literally trace my love of entertainment and of being on stage and being in front of people i can trace it to that moment being you know on a called it a pitch right for street performers i was at, at this pitch yeah. with lights I could hear the sound, the rush of the crowd, and that that thrill of being in front of people and doing this little trick, that always stuck with me. So my parents bought me a book on juggling for the car ride home back from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Philadelphia, and uh, I started doing little juggling shows in my kitchen for my parents, my grandmother. I just got really into it. I, I kind of had that vision of Peter Panic. You know, you had that experience. I was like, oh, I want to be like that guy. He was so cool. I remember he balanced a shopping cart on his chin. He juggled wine bottles. I uh, juggled fire. Like, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So that's that's how yeah. it started. I just I looked up to this performer, Peter Panic, and I had this moment that, um, yeah, that really kind of started everything for me. Wow, Peter Panic. Well, he's now. Um, have you like reconnected with him since your success? Like, have so funny, funny. You should ask that. Uh, Twenty years um, after that moment, I did reconnect with Peter. So come on, no, I, I, <laughs> I kid you not. Uh, actually, you can see the whole thing on Amazon Prime later this year. Uh, really, this is becoming an Amazon really? Prime special. Yeah. Uh, drop that on you. I don't think you you saw that on uh, anywhere when you poke it around. No, that was, that's the, no, no, no. That's not uh, that's not public yet. But um, yeah, it's very very exciting. So I um, I always wanted to have my own show in Las Vegas. We'll circle back to Peter here and that connection story. Yeah. Always want to have my own show in Las Vegas. It was like this weird dream. And it's kind of it's kind of crazy because if you think about it as a kid, you don't even really know what having a show in Las Vegas means. Right, you don't even yeah. know what Vegas is, but that's just mm -hmm. a testament to the power that Las Vegas has as a brand. I remember watching VHS tapes of Siegfried and Roy, David Copperfield, 
jugglers performing, you know, ventriloquists, comedians, acrobats of these shows. And it was always like, you know, the Mirage, the Dunes, the Sands, like they, they were you know, Caesar's Palace. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking like, that's what I want to do. I want to have my own show in Las Vegas. And we, we visited, my family loved to travel. And so we went to Vegas as, as, um, as a kid. I remember staying at the Excalibur and seeing these performers and, and, uh, for whatever reason I got it in my head, I was like, that's my goal. I want to have my own show in Las Vegas. Cause that's, that will officially make me like a successful performer, a successful entertainer, right? Obviously there's a million different paths to now, you know, a million different ways you could go about this crazy business, but, but that was mine. I had a goal. So we'll fast forward. 20 years roughly from that moment, I was signing my own contract with Caesars Entertainment uh, for the then Imperial Palace. If for those of your listeners mm. who know Vegas well, uh, the Imperial Palace is no longer with us. Rest in peace. Um, it is now the link. But back in the day, the IP, that was where I, I got my show. At uh, 2 o'clock, I, I started as a, as a matinee show. Uh, all the best shows play at 2 o'clock. Don't, don't be fooled. Always. Son. Always. Um, and so I was having this moment. I talk about this in my keynote. I was having this moment where I was literally signing contract as a producer and performer, my own show on the strip. This is my childhood dream come true. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking like, this is crazy. How, how did this happen? And I remembered Peter Panic. My family always instilled this idea to like, be grateful say thank you right so thought like wow wouldn't it be cool if i could find peter panic and tell him like what happened 20 years later i can directly trace that my origin story to him and i i thought about i was like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna figure this out like maybe i'll go back to boston see if he's still performing maybe i'll like ask around other performers if they know him this and, and then i was like wait let me just google him and of course peterpanic.com comes right up his website boom boom Website, contact page, phone number. Next thing I know, I am talking to my childhood inspiration. I right? become oh a, my gosh, hero. yeah. We had this very cool exchange. Um, I again, I talk about this in the keynote. It was one of these inflection points, one of these moments that I I knew in 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 the moment I knew I was going to remember this for the rest of my life because this was a very a powerful moment. So we decide to get together. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, next time I'm on the East Coast, I'm going to come to Boston and let's reconnect. Like, let's get a bite. So yeah. we arrange it. And you know, when you're a kid, you you think that, you know, everybody, you have no idea of age. You have no concept of how old anyone no. is, right? Nope. So I thought this guy was going to be like 100 years old. At the time, I was 30. He was 42, <laughs> which is hilarious. So, but as a kid, right? 10 years old, this kid, guy, another kid in his 20s picking me to be a volunteer. So anyway, long story short, we become friends. We're still connected, uh, you know, on social media every once in a while, you know, chat here and there. We've talked about gigs, the industry, we've told mm -hmm. stories, exchanged, you know, the stories over the years. He's still performing, right? He, he, he's a working entertainer. And I decided that I was going to fly him out for my last show on the Las Vegas Strip after 10 years. At least that was my hope. I really mm -hmm. wanted him to be there physically present because in my show, I tell this story, uh, some version of a story wow. and I, you see pictures of him and of me. And I thought, how cool would it be at the last show? I've got family there. I've got media there. All my, the folks from Caesars, how cool would I could be if I tell this story? And then if I could say, and tonight he's here, he's backstage. <laughs> like, do you want to meet Peter yeah, Panic? Drop. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah. Right? How awesome would that be? So he was super cool with it. You know, I flew him out. I put him up at the Paris. My show was at the Paris at the time and um, at the end of my run there. And it was just such a cool experience. We even performed together. Mm. We did like, a, we passed clubs and um, man, he killed it. It's hilarious. He comes out after tell the whole story and he's dressed in green, just like the video. He comes out and everybody's like, you know, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? And he just goes, you didn't think I was real, did you? And everybody just lost it. Uh, and it was just such a cool moment. And he said, he's like, it's all true. You know, um, he goes, you know, Jeff, Jeff called me and we reconnected and thought like, wow. And I talk about this in my keynote because man, that's like, Peter had no idea what he was doing. He thought he was just, you know, juggling in, in doing a street show. Right. He didn't realize that he had the, the power to really change someone's life change someone's trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I know we can talk about my nonprofit, but like Peter can be traced to my nonprofit, right? Because I started this nonprofit to bring performers to children's hospitals 
Peter did a visit with me when he was in Vegas. We went to the children's hospital. We performed together. So in a sense, like think about that ripple effect oh that gosh, Peter yeah. chose me, right? Because he was nice to me. He was kind to me, uh, you know, had that moment. And then, of course, supported by my family and and the, the my upbringing and had opportunities. I was for sure nurtured and and my entertainment, my love of entertainment was developed and, and encouraged, which also could have been another squashing point, right? But, um, but I had really supportive parents and brothers and family friends and they really they could see that I loved this and I was I was good at it and so they encouraged me. So anyway, so now we've got this nonprofit and we send performers to children's hospitals all over the country. And so the ripple effects happen you know exponentially all all the time now. And again, you can trace that back to Peter and I think about how many how many times are we all creating these ripple effects in wow. every interaction we have with someone unknowingly. And that's that's a really powerful thing to to keep in mind. Oh, it's massive. I love that. That is it's so easy, especially early stage, whether, you know, as, as I'm launching, you know, this podcast is less than a year old as I launched, you know, I've, I've, I've managed my, my financial planning practice for a while. So I've kind of seen the ripple effect there, but as I launched the personal development brand and as I oh, talk yeah. with other people, it's like, is the content that I'm creating is the message that I'm promoting or whatever I'm doing, is it really making a difference? Is it, you know, you don't see uh, uh, 20,000 views and all kinds of engagement. And, and so actually I want to, I'm going to get into that. In fact, it's actually a perfect segue. So, you know, you joked about the, the, the 2 PM, you know, those are the best shows. What would <laughs> you were headlining in Vegas? So that's a huge freaking deal, right? Like that's big, but you weren't always at some point you were, you were mm-hmm. out there grinding, doing whatever you had to do to probably get from A to B to C. I, you got to have connections. I know very little about that industry as a whole, but what I do understand is it's, it's, you got to be out there grinding and you have to, to network and connect and promote yourself in a way that allows you like, you just kind of show up and hope it all works out. That doesn't happen. It, yeah, usually. Right. Yeah. The yeah. grinding, the grinding did not stop when I got to Vegas, the grinding began <laughs> really Right when you get to Vegas, yeah. and and this is when you talk about like having a platform. I finally had a platform. It's like great. So what? What are you going to do with that platform? Right. It's not like um, you know. Sure, at a certain level, you just sit back and everybody comes to you. I was not at that mm-hmm. level. Right. Um, I am not at that level. I need to. I need to promote. I need to let people know who I am, what I do. Um, but real quickly before we go there, I just want to touch. Uh, you talk about you know this podcast you're doing, and you don't know how many views it's getting and what that means. Man, the one thing with with Peter and with some of these moments that I've had in hospitals, it's like if one person, I know it's cliche, but it's true. If if you help one person, think about how powerful that is. Mm-hmm. And then that person goes on and helps another person. And it's that like that is that ripple effect. I, I see that all the time doing these hospital visits like you have you don't really even know what you do. I, I, I can tell a story um, r- real quick. Oh, do of, it. Yeah, uh, this is good. Of, uh, no, so let's put it. Let's put a pin on the early years. Let's let's because I want to talk about the keynote yeah. too. So let's we're gonna let's keep rocking rocking cool. with the ripple effect here. So just roll right into that, and we'll come back okay. to the the early years. Yeah, I got a lot to say yeah. about Vegas yeah. too, and the, the hustle right. and the grind. Um, but we can make sure to talk about my my low point when when rats ate my inflatable oh, set. Yes, yeah, so we'll come back that to I that. had crowdfunded. <laughs> oh, geez. yeah, that's that's a good that's a good low point. There's been a lot of low points. Um. Relic. It's high highs and low lows. That's what my my uh, best friend here in Vegas is the uh, audio. En- he's the chief studio engineer for Imagine Dragons, Ooh. and so like kind of parallel career, right? Music recording, yep. mixing, different world, but similar challenges. And we talk about these like high highs and low lows. Like you know, one one day he's like mixing a you know song that's on a, a Grammy album. You know, in the next minute he's like doing a commercial. You know for like some some silly like jingle for a commercial yeah. and they're like no we don't like it we're we're passing you know what i mean and and it's like this up and down it's the same thing right for me it's like you know oh, headlining in vegas this is amazing and then the next thing you know you rats are eating your set and and you know you're you're like what am i gonna do now so um but yeah so back to the the, the grandfather and the grandson story so I share this story as well in my keynote because it's a good example of the, the power that we have when we don't even realize it. Again, Peter was just, he thought he was just doing a show. Um, and I think as performers, it's really easy to just kind of crank out shows. Mm-hmm. And and you're thinking about from your point of view, you're like, ah, that wasn't that, that wasn't my best show. Like, ah, it wasn't. But for somebody in the audience, you never know what they're dealing with. You never know what they're going through. I've had countless times where people, you know, back when I was on cruise ships, like, a hundred years ago, 
you know, I had old lady come up to me in the buffet line and I'm like, this is a show on Holland America line. It was like, you know, it's not the most creatively fulfilling show. It was fine. It was like a fine show. And she's like, Hey, you know, I just want to say thank you. I was supposed to be on this cruise with my husband. Uh, it was going to be our 50th wedding anniversary. He passed away mm-hmm. like earlier this year. I decided to still take the cruise. Like, and now I know why I did like, because of your show. Like I, I wow. know what it's like to smile again. Like I haven't smiled. I haven't laughed in like nine months. So like, thanks for that. You're just thinking like, I'm like grabbing eggs Benedict. Yeah. And you're like, uh, wait, what? <laughs> like me, my, my little juggling show with some jokes, like, wow like you know that that effect so anyway the power of uh, you can have on one person just incredible um the, i was in the hospital doing a win-win visit at sunrise children's hospital uh, just a few blocks east of the strip here and um grandfather grandson grandson's pretty checked out you know dozing in and out on, on on meds and um not not really all there and i had this interaction with the grandfather he's wearing a vegas golden knights baseball cap and so i asked if i could do a little trick with his hat balance the hat on my nose and catch it on my head and like give it to him. And I give him two tickets to my show, which was at the Flamingo at the mm-hmm. time. And I said, hey, when you're better, come see me. Um, so after the show, months later, I'm doing my meet and greet out in the lobby. And I see grandfather, grandson, kids full of life, bouncing around, mm-hmm. happy as can be. And the grandfather says, man, you have no idea what you did. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, like, oh, it was fun. It was great meet. I'm so good to see you. And he's like, no, no. He's like, my grandson wasn't eating before you came in, like he was checked out, you know, and you gave him like a spark, you know, you, he was like trying to do the trick. Like when you, when you left, he was like, I really want to see the show. We were watching your videos online. Like it gave him something to look forward to. It was like a personal interaction. It was touch just being there for that moment. And I'm thinking like, again, like I'm a juggler. Like, how is that really like that, that? And so he said like, keep doing what you're doing, man. Like it's awesome, awesome work. And, and it's really needed. And again, that was just that, Oof, wow. moment of yeah. like, you know, yeah, I, I was probably on that, that day, I was probably doing a million other things, right? I stopped by the hospital for like an hour or two mm-hmm. as part of my win-win visit. But then I was probably like, you know, hitting UPS store, going to lunch with somebody, like just going about my day. And you realize like, you may have saved some kid's life, like let alone, you know, what that did for the family or the meaning. It just kind of puts everything in perspective. And again, back to that point of we have so much more power and influence uh, over people than we think. Well, so you talk about your keynote, you talk about having a bigger platform than we realize. And I mean, you say it jokingly, like, look, I'm a juggler and look what I've done. Like, a man, like, but you've done so much yeah. more than that. But I get what you're trying to say, the, the, the irony of it. I guess, how do you get to a point where you can actually acknowledge that you do have a platform? Because, you know, let's say I'm a juggler, like, I wouldn't necessarily think Every like, yeah, platform. but like, how, like, but we think we don't, though. I talked to so many people, like, yeah, and, we're, and, and they're just like, well, you know, it's a side gig. No one really knows. Like, it's like, no, dude, you could, you're good, or, or you're so, like, how do you yeah. expand your mind, though? Or how did you expand your mind and work past I'm a, I'm a entertainer to I am changing lives? Like, was that an overnight thing? Did you just, were you in tune to it? Did, did you, was it yeah, intentional? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I jokingly, I'm self-deprecating about, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a juggler, but it proves the point because think about, yeah, think about like if I can do what I've done at the end of the day, I show up, I, I've been a lot of different things I do, right? I'm an entertainer, I'm an MC, I'm a keynote speaker, but as an entertainer, at the end of the day, I show up, I tell jokes and I juggle. Mm-hmm. I pull people up on stage, I do different stunts, balancing improv audience interaction. But at the end of the day, like I show up and I do juggling tricks. I, I package it in a different way. I market it and monetize it. I brand it in a different way as an MC, right? I am doing intros, outros, but I'm weaving in entertainment. I'm pulling people up. I'm juggling. I'm doing fun, balancing stunts. So it's the end of the day. It's like juggling, (laughs) even as a keynote speaker, it's wrapped up in an entertainment message. And there's a lot of entertainment in my keynote. Mm. Right. So I, I, I kind of say jokingly, like, yeah, I'm as a juggler, I can do this, but think about what you do. Right. And whoever you is, who's listening, the market most likely already values what you do a lot more than juggling, right? Like let's say you're in health and wellness, right? Or real estate or right sales or software. Like we as a society have, have said like, these are important things like teach, you know, education, healthcare, like whatever your industry is. So I do love the juggling example because I, I am working at a deficit because when I, when I show up and juggle, people are probably thinking they think like, 
clowns, circuses, juvenile, right? <laughs> it really though, like I'm not, no, I, no, I, I am aware it. of that. I'm aware of that. Like even as your intro, you you say like, oh yeah, he juggles, he rides a unicycle. Like most people are probably thinking like, what can I learn from this guy? Mm-hmm. And so I like that. I have fully embraced that because the people who really know me are like, man, he's he's got everybody fooled. Like sure. Mm-hmm. There's a percentage of people who look at him and it was like, he, he juggles and touch other. Like, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of fun and cute. But like, he's probably not very successful or like he probably doesn't make that much money or he probably doesn't X, Y, Z. Like we fill in all these things that we that we want to. And again, I'm not trying to prove that to anybody. I'm just trying to live my own, you know, live my own deal. Right. And, have, yeah, and, and yeah. do my own thing. So I do like the juggling example because I think, hey. If you're, you know, let's go to health, right? If you're a nutritionist or a health coach or a trainer or something like that, again, the market, society, humans already believe in that, in the value of that, and they see that. So it makes it easier for you to market brand and monetize mm. your platform in those respective genres. That's that's the point of what I'm what I'm trying to say. And so to me, I feel like everybody has a platform. If I can have a platform as a juggler and continually kind of push what that platform could mean and what it could look like, that it could mean I founded and run a nonprofit that's a national network of performers giving back what people, most people probably wouldn't think that. Wow. If that could mean does keynote talks for major companies and associations. Wow. If that could mean run a a very successful business with employees and wow, like I could use that to travel. Like you can, you can, you know, do so much with, you know, what, what, a, what may appear to be so little. And I put that in quotes of just like, you know, that, that perception of like, oh, you know, juggling, telling jokes, doing a juggling show. And so I love the idea of, of continually reinventing and kind of pushing one's awareness of, of the impact and influence you can have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are kind of sold like this is what success or this is what a true platform looks like and it usually has to do with social media and an inter- like a musician or an actor or some high powered mm-hmm. ceo or this or that or the other thing and so we don't even we're not even aware like i mean you're, you're highlighting like think of that nutritionist like you literally are changing people's lives you might exactly keep somebody, how do you not you see might that keep yeah. somebody alive and that person might be someone who starts uh, a nonprofit exactly. to save the ripple effect. Yeah, it's this ripple. Yeah. It's this, and this is exactly. it's an impossibility. Like the human mind cannot understand like infinite, you know, infinite possibilities. But there are infinite possibilities when you go out there and do that. So then it's almost like okay. So kind of going back to those, those early years, how did you stay motivated? How do you see it? How do you? Yes, see that was it? that was the original how question. Vis- I'm sorry. No, no, no. This was perfect because that because we need we yeah. needed to park there. So we all have a platform, you have yes. to see it and be aware of it and understand it. it. Like it starts there, but then how do you actually start like to build momentum? I had a, a guest on recently and is uh, Evan Carmichael actually, you know, he wrote a book on momentum, like just like, yeah, once you're moving, then movement begets more movement. Like, Oh, I changed right. this guy's life. Cool. I'm going to do more of this. I changed this girl's life, but it's when you don't see that it's like, uh, I'm going to stop juggling. I'm going to put the balls away. I'm going to stop, you know, whatever. And so yep. what did you no, you're yeah, right. Tell me about that. So, okay. So just like I feel compelled because my Peter story, my story of Peter was so like, it's a Hallmark movie. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> like the boy who learned to juggle. Right. It really is it's like this guy circled back. Yeah. The, Peter panic. <laughs> yeah. Peter panic. Come on. You, you see him dress it all green. Yeah. It's like, it, it's almost like people, that's why that line works so well when he comes out and he says, you didn't think I was real. Did you? Because people are like, no way. Too Disney. Because it's yeah. such a, it's such a Disney, you're right. It's such a feel good Hallmark channel, like feeling of, wow, this gets circled back and found him. And now they, you know, friends and that. Right. Okay. So I use that kind of smacking me in the face to make other people aware of how this happens in their world all the time in a much more subtle way, in a way that is not as obvious, but is still there. And I even talk about that story with the grandfather. Mm -hmm. That ripple came back around to me about six months later, right? Peter's ripple came back 20 years. So I said, I, I feel very fortunate to have had this kind of Hallmark movie experience because it literally, not literally, it it figuratively smacked me in the face because I thought, wow, 
this is amazing what this guy did for me. And now what I'm passing on, we all do this all the time. So your, your, your question originally 40 minutes ago was, (laughs) sorry, uh, you get me going, you get me me excited and passionate. My, your question was, how did you see that? And I say, I feel fortunate, just like the story with Peter kind of forced me to see, see that I feel fortunate because entertainment does that because it's a one-on-one reaction and response. When I am, I worked at Disney. I was a, a boardwalk busker at the boardwalk resort in, in Orlando. I worked at Disney Springs. And when you are, have a family in front of you and you give a child a spinning plate, put a plate on there and they go, wow. And the mom and dad want to take a picture. That is an immediate reaction that you can see you improved someone's life in a, in a small way, of course, but think about the bigger picture. They're on vacation. You created a memory, you're bonding, their family's having a good time together. So they're having a loving experience, which is great for the kids. It's great for the family. Like, all of that, right, is there. So I feel, again, I feel very fortunate to be in entertainment where I get to see that immediate reaction. Plus, as an entertainer, like, there's nothing there's nothing better than laugh, oh, yeah. you know, cheer, mm-hmm. punch, like, reaction, right? And, and that's why I have the utmost respect for all these other industries that don't get that mm-hmm. immediate feedback. Like a teacher, it might take <laughs> the course of a semester or years, yeah. really, to, like, see – the, the influence you had on the formation of a young man or woman. I get to see that immediate reaction. It's like a dopamine hit. Mm-hmm. I get to, and it feels good and I want more of it. So when you said, how do you see, kind of learn to see yourself as, um, as having a platform, having influence, I think entertainment makes it so easy because it's just so like, it's so real. It's so yeah. tactile. It's so in the moment, like smiles, laughter, joy. It's cont- It's contagious. Like, you just you get wrapped up in it, and at least as a kid, I love that feeling, mm-hmm. and I wanted mm-hmm. more of it. I still love that feeling. Like I, I still that's one of the reasons why I do what I do is I get I get to have that immediate reaction and sense that I I made someone's life better. Like they're they're a little happier, they're a little lighter when they walk out than they were when they walked in because yeah. there's a lot going on in the world and we're more divided than ever. And you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of shit oh, yeah. out there right, oh, yeah. going on. And, and so it's kind of cool to be able to take people's pain away for 30 minutes, an hour, 75 minutes and give them an experience that they're going to look back fondly mm-hmm. on. And hopefully then as they leave, yes, they, they've laughed, they've been entertained, but they've also been like inspired and motivated to be good people, yeah. like to be yep. nice to people. Like it's not, it's, it's more, it's more subtle in, especially in my shows. I'm not preaching at people, but I want them to feel like, wow, that was, wow. Like that was a really good story. I tell that story of Peter, right? I, I mm-hmm. use kids on stage. So unless you're like completely missing all of that, if you're just, you're just, you know, drunk watching in Vegas, like most people kind of get it and they, they get some of those themes that are underneath and they feel like, wow, this was a cool, like full circle moment. And I'm seeing this actualization of this kid following his dreams, being grateful, circling back, thanking mm-hmm. the person, creating these ripples, not just in his own life, but with every audience that he, you know, reaches and touches and mm-hmm. all these nonprofit performers that get involved and and the the goodness of the world and kind of the positivity that gets put out into humanity just amplifies exponentially through all of the ripples we create every day from bigger work, like nonprofit service ministry, et cetera, down to just smiling at someone on the street, like being nice to people, being courteous, ha- exchanging a laugh, like yeah. shared human experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like just, I have done, I'm done good. for a while. Just like, sorry. don't be a dick and you're already a better person. But so I want to, <laughs> sorry, I should have said that when you're drinking. Um, I mean, asphyxiated <laughs> on the show. Yeah. Man. Spit yeah, yeah, yeah. takes, spit takes. All right. So look, so, you know, it's true feedback. Me- there's a feedback mechanism built in entertainment. Sure. However, so you know, with investing inward, it's my my that was mantra. such a be- more succinct way of saying it. By the way, <laughs> hey, you know, I try. Um, There's a feedback mechanism built into entertainment. It's true. That was the last Boom. fifteen minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. I love it, but it's thinking intentionally, living differently. How we think, if we think mm. intentionally, we will live differently. So I saw, I heard two things in what you said there. Number one, you know, Peter Panic. It took twenty years, and a lot of us don't have the patience for that feedback mechanism Mm -hmm. to close. We give up before it happens because it didn't happen six months later. However, 
equally, you know, you talk about there's laughs, the kids smile, the applause, this or that. In most of what we do, not everything, but I mean, I don't want to get like over dramatic or romantic about it or whatever, but a lot of things we do, if we are intentional, if we think about who's benefiting by this positive reaction, like you could have just showed up, oh, it's a two o'clock show, oh, I'm on the cruise line, who gives a damn, whatever, do, do, mm-hmm. do my, you know, and walk away and not and be completely blind to the laughs that you brought to the smiles to the memories that you created so there was a level of intentionality and so whether it's entertainment that tends to have that more feedback heavy sort of thing or you're sitting down i mean you're helping a couple buy a house or you're helping someone lose weight or you're building like what i'm doing with my clients with you know helping plan their retirements like it's not sexy it's not fun necessarily but there are those moments and when you intentionally look for them that's exactly. when you'll start to see them. And those little things exactly. will give you the momentum and the patience to wait out that Peter Panic moment, whether we have one of them, whether we have 10, it doesn't matter. I think it's a, there's this intentionality that I'm hearing a lot from you that I think is missing in, because we're not necessarily even taught to think intentionally. We're very passive. Okay, so you mentioned, you said uh, buying a house or financial planning, it's not very sexy. Let me tell you real life, Real life example, uh, from when we were recording this, two days ago, I gave a keynote to a company that provides, that creates and implements software products and processes for the insurance industry. So they're not insurance mm. agents. They're not selling to fans, but they are, you know, a couple steps removed, but they're creating this, uh, these, again, products and processes, right? To, to make to make everything must, go must faster. have been a killer atmosphere. Well, ho- well, hold on. So, so my <laughs> keynote, right? It's called work that matters. Yeah. This is what we talked about. This is what I talked about. It said, you know, you are making through the work you do, you are making insurance faster, easily, uh, excuse me, faster, easier, more accessible. Mm-hmm. 70 million people in, in America are, are uninsured or underinsured. If you could take the process of having a 60 day, uh, you know, process. If you could get that down to 60 minutes, what do you think is going to happen? More people are going to get insured because it's easier, faster, more accessible yep. and wouldn't efficiency scale more lives get insured. Obviously that means they're going to make more money. Sure. But isn't that also a very good thing to do to ensure the lives of more markets, to take care of, of families, you know, with life insurance yep. who are going through horrible situations. Right. And so that's what I said. I said, yeah, you know, you, you are at the end of the day, you're making insurance easier, faster, more accessible. Like that's a worthy mission. So sure. You're going to be in the minutia of red tape or policy or this or that, or this product, but like, don't lose sight of the big picture of what's going on here. Because again, I think we all lose sight of the power, the effect we have because we don't see ourselves as a platform. And, uh, yeah. or we don't re I talk about reimagining the power of your platform, right? Which again, mm-hmm. you don't have to think about it all the time, but in, in their world, just to use this example, if at some point if they're having a bad day or they're red tape or they're going through something kind of like somewhere back in their mind, they realize, you know what, this is more than just a business. We're actually doing good work here because we're making it easier for people to get insured. And that's a good thing. I told a story on stage from one of the executives who who shared with me on a, on a pre call as I was getting to to learn about the organization. He said that 25 years ago he sold a life insurance policy to somebody, and he said um, the guy sent him a check. He never got the check, so he called and said, "Hey, I never got your check." And he said, "Well, too bad. I'm not I'm not paying the 25 dollar cancellation fee for the check." And so the executive did the right thing, threw 25 bucks in the mail sent him a letter and said, Hey, sorry, man, I, I, I don't know what happened with the mail. Not my deal, but like, keep this. Here's the money. I can you please send me another one? I would really like to get you coverage. So the guy sends him another check a week later, two months later, the guy's dead. Oh, His shit. wife calls the executive who sold him the policy now. Right. And says that he got diagnosed and is now passed away of cancer within 60 days. And she had no idea that they were this close to not having a life insurance policy. She was like, oh my gosh, over a $25 cancellation check, right? (laughs) Now, again, that's an extreme example, but just Mm -hmm. like Peter was an extreme example. Not everybody is going to have those stories, those moments, 
and you don't have to even have them firsthand. This this may be something to to hold. You everybody might not have a Peter Pan moment, but knowing with this insurance example, wow, like that's what we're doing. That's the effect we have. And it, I, I we talk about insurance because it's like the least sexy example ever, right? Least sexy yeah. industry. But like even again, you can find it there. You I can find it with juggling. You can find it in life insurance. Like how many other people in a in a crowd of eight hundred had a story like that? Probably at least another couple dozen, right? Oh yeah. Or or they know of someone, maybe an or agent of, of theirs. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, so anyway, that's again tangent, but just to show the point of like everyone has these moments. Mm-hmm. It's about pulling them out and keeping them top of mind for when life does get hard and when there are those challenges, when the next pandemic happens or the next, you know, political <laughs> div- division happens. Like that you could I think you can lean back on that. You can fall back on on that feeling of knowing that the work you do really matters. And man, if if I'm talking to teachers or like healthcare workers, I mean it's a it's a of course, right? It's it mm-hmm. it's so obvious because again, we as a society, we are very well aware and generally appreciative and thankful for like the work that teachers do, the work that yeah. doctors do, that nurses do. Like we have nurses day and teachers, you know, we, mm-hmm. we are like, okay, we get that. It's, it's those less sexy industries, right? Like insurance where it takes a little bit more work, but I, I promise you, I've spoken to so many different groups. Every group I talk to, the stories that come out, like blow me away. I was speaking to a collections agency once <laughs> in South Dakota, right? And I'm like, oh, this is going to be tough. Like, you know, these people that call, they probably just get just get like crap on the phone all day long. People are like mad at them, like, you know, hanging up on them, right? And I've got I got stories of people saying, you know, having these real human moments where, where someone's saying, hey, I, I don't understand why I'm getting these fees. Like, can you can you walk me through this bill? And the person's saying like, yeah, absolutely. And like literally explaining to them, like APRs and like um, how how credit cards work, like yeah. cycles and like when a, uh, when a cycle closes and how long they have it's due and how that affects credit and like paying minimums versus paying the full thing versus not paying and like how – and I remember her saying, she was like, I felt like I was actually making a difference because the woman on the other end was like, thank you for – telling me this, like I, I, no one's ever shared this yeah. with me. And like, obviously that person didn't grow up in, in a way, in a way that enabled, you know, her to learn that either from mm-hmm. family or from schooling or from whatever. And so again, even if a collections agency person can feel like, man, I'm making a difference. And I'm, I, other stories of like, I enabled, you know, I got somebody to get a loan for their first home or they send their first mm-hmm. kid, first kid in their family generation went to college. Like, and I played a role in that because I was helping them build their financial history and build their credit. Anyway, you get the point. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, then that's, and that's, I, I think it couldn't be better said. And you highlighted the things that nobody would think of, you know, life changing. These are some of the industries that just proves that if you look for it, if you're intentional, you can find it. Yeah. So, so, all right, you have this childhood dream, you want a headline on the Vegas strip and you do that for a decade. And I mean, we could, we could take it probably a whole episode, just talking about the experiences um, and, and, and all of that. But I'm really intrigued because you you ended it. We chatted about this before we started recording. This wasn't like, oh, you know, it got canceled by COVID or, you know, yeah. oh, the, you know that they thought you sucked. So they just kind of booted you <laughs> like this was intentional. You went out. Yeah. And is it like is it like what Brady should have done like a couple of years ago? <laughs> like what what like what led up to I that? mean, like, you're the numbers, the pinnacle, man. <laughs> the numbers are a little different. So I, I don't judge Tom Brady for making his own. uh <laughs> Well, you know, he, decision. he ran into some other issues, but anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know what? That's a really good point because I, I, I think a lot of people look at me. Um, they're a little confused because they're like, "Wait, you had this childhood dream, you got it, mm-hmm. you're living it, yeah. and then you walked away from it." And I think that's. I think it can be a trap. I think. Um, I think. I think we often get kind of locked into what what we're doing in the moment. It's comfortable. It's easy, and. Again, I I was searching for this like title. Las, I want to be a Las Vegas headliner, and then you get that title and you get that platform, and you realize like, oh, this is this is where the real work begins. This is now I have reach, I have influence, 
I, that's why I grew win win. And I set up these scholarships for you know, my sound, my original sound guy passed away. Um, the best, the best guy in the world. And, uh, you know, passed away too far too soon. Um, so I set up scholarships in his name, uh, for arts, for tech, like art students in, in, mm-hmm. um, sound design here in Vegas. And like, that gives me a lot of joy is now like it's in his, it's in his name, his company, and I get to do that. Right. So think about mm-hmm. what you, what you do with the platform you have. And again, my platform has grown. I do believe that everybody has a platform and can continue, continually kind of increase through intentional awareness, their reach and impact. Um, but for me, I realize like, I don't need that title anymore to give me the sense of like being someone or having a platform. Uh, mm. it, it almost was restrictive at a certain point. Vegas can be a little bit of a bubble. Um, I absolutely love it here. Uh, but, but it, it, you know, when you're performing six nights a week on the strip and you're concerned about ticket sales and marketing every day, that's a lot. And, um, I wanted to do other things. I wanted to pursue other projects. I wanted to give a lot more time to my nonprofit. We have no paid staff, all performers donate their time and talent. So Mm -hmm. that means that if it was going to grow beyond where it was, I needed to take a more active role and I wanted to give more time to that brings me a lot of joy. I wanted to start speaking about a lot of what we talked about today, the ripples ripple effect. I I felt like I had a good message. I felt like I had a good story. I wanted to share it. I wanted to create this, you know, Amazon special. I'm working on a show now called laughter without borders which is an international show where, you know, again, doesn't matter the language, the socioeconomic barriers. I'm bringing joy to some of the farthest corners of the world. And I'm taking a different performer with me every week. And I'm really Mm -hmm. excited about that. We're filming the first one in Thailand uh, later in May. Um, going to a fun. bunch of different things. Yeah, I'm taking a, a good friend of mine, a performer, and and we're doing shows, again, for kids like all over Thailand, these different sites. And that, that to me shows like, that's what I'm all about, right? The ripples, the, the, the Peter, Peter and I could have been anywhere. The, you know, mm-hmm. it wasn't dependent on language, wasn't dependent on country, on religion, on politics, on anything like that. Like Peter yeah. and I, that story could have happened anywhere. And so I, I want to kind of prove that um, by taking that, um, that sense of laughter and joy and community and, and bringing that to different areas of the world. So hmm. anyway, yeah. I, I think it takes a lot of confidence. It takes a lot of, um, you know, it's a risk. You, you can't be risk averse sure. to say, to say, I'm going to leave this because it's a home base for you. But I would mm-hmm. encourage anybody who's, who's maybe like at a level where they, they thought they wanted to be, they thought they wanted to end kind of like I thought I was like, oh, I'll be a, I'll, I'll have my own show in Las Vegas. And like, that's it. Like I will have made it. And then like, that will be my life. I'll perform every night in Vegas. And that's that. That's, that's all my limited understanding could process as a kid. But when I got there, obviously like the game changes, what you want to do, what makes you happy changes, what, what you can do changes. And so I do think that's a potential trap for entrepreneurs, especially because they think like, I want to do this thing. And then if they get to that level, if that's not making you happy or fulfilling you the same way that that journey was or or that that struggle was or that those first few years, you should feel, you should not feel like you're quitting. You should not feel like you're failing. You're just like priorities changed. You know what you want changes. Um, You know, we talk about all the time, even like with, with politics and things like, you know, if you get, you get different information, you get new information and you change your mind about something. That's not like giving up. That's not failing. That's like evolving. That's growing. Yeah. It's growth. Yeah. yeah it's it's growth. growth. So, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, so it's funny cause there's two camps of people in my world. There's my friends who are like, Oh dude, that's awesome. Like they get it. They, they understand like, man, you were, you, you became like too big for Vegas. You're like, you know what? You know, you did that and you want to like move on. And I get that. And then there's some people who are just like, I don't understand why, why would you do that? Like it doesn't compute yeah. for them. And that's, that's fine. But for me, I knew that it wasn't going to make me happy to be performing six nights a week in Vegas for another 10 years. That's <laughs> right. Right. So let me ask you this. Cause you, and you even mentioned the Madden dragons earlier. I was listening to their lead singer. I can't think of his last name. I know it's Dan, whoever. Reynolds. Um, Thank you. So he was on, uh, it was a behind the brand. It was an older episode and I had found it. Um, and he had taught, it was really just like getting into the reality of things and it was super transparent. And he had talked about, you know, you think this, this idea like, Oh, I'm going to be a rock star. 
and all I want to be is a rock star. And then you're a rock star. And then you realize, oh, being a rock star is not everything's cracked up to be. Now what? And in his case, there was some spiraling down before he recovered this, that, and the other thing. So yeah. in your case specifically, was it was there some of that? Like, oh my gosh, I just have to be a Vegas headliner. And then you got there and then it was like, okay, now what? I have it. And it was not what you thought it was? Or or was it that you found more enjoyment like in the pursuit of being that? And then you just always have to be pursuing something like if like what? Yeah, because I'm always intrigued by that. Because like, when you hit these pinnacles of certain things, you hear that a lot, like, Oh, I did this. And then it was like, Oh, now what? Or I got this car, yeah. I had this job, this title, this business, this movie, you know, so then it kind of makes you think, well, what's the point of trying if you're going to get there, and you know, it's not going to fulfill you anyways, like, yeah. So I've always been the type of person who has moved on before I grow, I get bored or I grow unhappy. So mm -hmm. I, I, I was not, it's not like I got to Vegas and got here. I was like, Oh, this isn't what I thought it'd be. Like it, it wasn't what I thought I'd be, because, but that's because I had no idea what it would be. I, I had no idea that it was more <laughs> of the business side and it was all of the marketing, but I genuinely enjoy that. I love, I love making like dinner show deals and making deals with other shows. And yeah, um, I, the 25, 75, yeah. The the $75 show for $25. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I heard you tell that story. Yeah, I heard that story in a different, you know, I do my. I do oh, my I'm research. impressed. I, I love that. I love that one. That was all about perception. Well, yeah. We'll, we'll see if we perception, get that. Anyways, man. That was good. Dude, yeah. that's entertainment <laughs> taught me a lot about that. Yeah. Um, but yes. Uh, so, like, I can remember this even as far. I remember. I worked at Bush Gardens in Williamsburg when I was 16 and 17. Mm. And it was like the coolest job ever. I did shows. I did six shows a day, six days a week um, out in the sun. But it was it was fun. Like I was a kid, yeah. you know, just pulling, doing shows. And I could have done that easily for like another five or six summers, right? In school, college. And nobody would have, nobody would have like faulted me for that. But after the second year, right? I remember the first year I was like, what is performing? You know, I didn't know anything. I was like my first real gig. By the second year, I was like, cool. Like, I'm good here. Like, I want to move on. And so I started mailing off my VHS tapes so, <laughs> so we're at, to uh, cruise ship agencies. Because I'm like, oh, all these performers in my dressing room, they all want to be on cruise ships. So I'm like, oh, like cruise ships. That's probably like the next step from theme parks. So I did cruise ships for a while, right? And again, I would see guys on cruise ships who were like, you know, I do 50 weeks a year and like I another 20 years and I'll retire. And they're like 45. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. Like yeah. cruise ships is fun. But like I did that for a couple summers and then I was on Disney Cruise Line and I really connected with the Disney brand and um, the executives and just the vibe. And I, I loved I loved, you know, Disney and uh, the parks as a kid growing up with family. Yeah. And um, so I decided to move to Orlando and do a lot of work in and around Disney. I was never a cast member, but I did a lot of like subcontract work for Disney at, like mm -hmm. I said, at um, the boardwalk and at Disney Springs and at corporate events, hosted festivals and things like that. So yeah. again, I kind of moved on before I was like, well, I've been on cruise ships for 15 years and I hate myself. Like I, d I didn't ever want to get there. Right. Even though like as a kid, I was like, this is amazing. This is fun. I'm traveling and cool. Like, but I want to move mm -hmm. on. Right. So again, Orlando, I was in Orlando for like two and a half years and I was like, cool. Like, this is great. I hosted the Food and Wine Festival at Epcot. I hosted the marathon. I did, you know, shows at Disney Springs at uh, uh, Downtown Disney, as it was called, the Boardwalk Buskers. I did corporate events at the Swan Dolphin and Grand Floridian and all these things. I, I worked at Bush Gardens in Tampa. I worked at Universal. I did shows at SeaWorld. I did, yeah, over the yeah. course of like three years, I kind of like, I feel people from Orlando are going to hate this, but like, I feel like I kind of did Orlando. Now, I'm not saying yeah. that you can't, you know, make a very nice, a great living, you know, but it was kind of like, all right, like if I'm going to be here, I think I'm just going to do like more of this at a higher mm -hmm. level and at a busier level. And like, I don't want that. I want to move on. And again, I always had Vegas in the back of my mind. So at that point I was like, all right, now's the time. I'm like early twenties, you know, going to go to Vegas. So again, move to Vegas and we could keep going here with, you know, the nonprofit and keynote speaking and the special and the, the international show. I just always like to keep, I always like to keep moving before I get to a point where I'm like, well, I probably should have stopped that a few years back. Like, I don't, I don't ever want to be that guy. I don't want to feel like that. Um, I, I thrive on on movement, on energy, on on um, forward momentum. We talked about momentum a little bit. I, I thrive on that, and to me, I, I'm all about action. 
and I just want to keep, I just want to keep moving. I want to, cause if I'm moving, I'm experiencing new things. I'm meeting new people. I'm growing, I'm stretching. And that, that to me is like my, my drug, you know, that's, that's what yeah. I love. So it's like, it's like pulling a George Costanza. You got to go out on the high note. Like you have yeah. to. And so no, it's in your case, right? Like, so, okay. What do you keep, do add something else to scratch that itch, to keep that pursuit of excellence, of growth, of evolution, of education, whatever. And then you can still continue. And I've found that since launching the podcast, I've been more motivated to work in my business. Not that I wasn't before, but it's given me, because I'm talking sure. with awesome people like you on a, a you know monthly basis, you know, have three, four conversations a month, sometimes more. And, and I'm like using some of this content in conversations with my clients. It's like, oh, cool. Like, yeah. Oh, 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 by the way, I'm talking to this musician or this headliner, or this author, by the way, he's on the Wall Street, you know, so, you know, that's cool. And so <laughs> I think there's something to that is you don't stay in something because you're in something. You stay in something because you love it and it's fulfilling. And if it, it, there's nothing wrong with getting out or adjusting or introducing something new before you get to the point where you absolutely despise it. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, Man, something you said uh, tr triggered something else in me, and then I just went – it went away. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Got it. So entertainment. We talked about how entertainment has forced me to think about a lot of these things mm -hmm. that I might not otherwise have thought about. So I'm very grateful for for the career in entertainment, um, just like the Peter story – you know, cause me to see the ripples and right, the immediate impact I have on somebody enables me to see how that could happen when it's not as immediate or, or direct. Um, it's the same thing with the career and finding fulfillment. Entertainment, it's all about you. It's, and by you, I mean me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, when you're an entertainer, you're like, yeah. you know, you're practicing your thing so you can show th people your thing to get feedback on your thing. And then you capture, record, package, market, and monetize your thing and tell everybody how great you are at doing your thing so that they'll hire you more to do your thing. It's all about yeah. you. With win-win, when you walk into a hospital room, even the most aloof, obtuse entertainer who thinks it is all about him or her knows it is not about him or her in that moment. It is so very not about him or her. It is about the child, the family, the care, the moment. You are there to serve, to be present, to brighten up the life of someone in need. Everybody yeah. gets that. Everybody can see that. Again, smacks you on the face, right? So I love sharing that because I, I do think it's a gift. Mm -hmm. When you share that, other performers have this experience often for the first time. And then they don't even know. They don't even know why, but they come back to me and they say like, that was amazing. Like, I want to do more of that. It's like, yeah, because it wasn't about you. That's why it was amazing. That's like, so good. Because you usually, and again, it's not, I'm not faulting you. I, I am one of you, no. right? Mm -hmm. I am an entertainer. Like, I, that's why I love doing this is because for an hour, two, more, whatever, you, you turn off your phone. You don't care about social media. You don't care about likes or follows or bookings or gigs mm -hmm. or money or anything like that. And it just touches such a unique part of your head and your heart that it, it it's addicting. Like it's that fulfillment yeah. and people want more of it. So the, the best thing for me is like when I get a performer and they're going to stop by the hospital and they're like, Oh yeah, I'm really busy. You know? So, you know, I don't, I don't want to bail on you, but like, I can, I just gotta, I gotta cut the visit. So I'm going to pop by for like 20 minutes, you know, six hours later, they call You're me. You're always like, sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They call me and they'd be like, "Oh, hey, man, do you uh, any chance I can come back? Um, come back next <laughs> week? You know, I, I I met, I dropped off like a deck of cards. I taught this kid Timmy, like you know, some yeah. some tricks. I want to go check up him. I want to like, it's like, yeah, of course, you know. Bro, and it's not even fair anymore. It's like it's the gateway. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. You know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. <laughs> totally. It, it the hardest part is getting a performer to do the yeah. first visit. Once they do the first visit. Not, I would say 90% of performers are hooked and they're like, I want to do more of that. And some will actually call and say, put me down for one a month because they know their life is busy, but they just yeah. want to like get it on the calendar. Or they say, hey, you know what? I want to make sure I'm doing one a quarter or one a month. And like, so stay on me for it. You know, like I'm up for it. They just got to stay on me. 
And then I would say there's a small percentage of performers who I actually think it's kind of too much for them and they don't really know how to process it. And like yeah. they, get, they, yeah, they get through it, but they can't really handle it. And they're, they're uncomfortable yeah. with it because, you know, you could walk out to a crowd of 2,500 screaming fans loving you. And that's easy. You walk into a hospital room and you have to kind of introduce yourself and like meet them where yeah. they are and, and try to bring mm-hmm. them up. And they don't know you. They don't care. They might be on medication or they might have just gotten – might be scared about this or – mm-hmm. that's like way harder. So oh, um, yeah. on a separate note, I've even told – I, I have a lot of younger you know, performers who will reach out to me and ask me for advice. And I'll tell them to do charity work. Say because there's nothing harder as an entertainer. If you can, if you can perform one-on-one at a children's hospital, if you can do charity events – and for special events, organizations, special needs schools, you know, uh, senior care facilities, if you can entertain in those types of environments, then like you're bulletproof, you know, when you get to the, oh, yeah. a big theater or a corporate event or something, because you've seen it all and you've worked out and you've gotten confident in yourself and you've learned how to meet the audience where they are and, mm-hmm. and, you know, bring them up from there, which is a priceless skill as an entertainer. So that's always my, my go-to and they, they need it and they love it. Right. So what, what children's hospital, what special needs home is going to turn down if you're offering you're a magician and you, you want to come to a show like they're gonna be like, oh, my gosh, yes. Thank you so much. That's Please, that's why yeah. win win exists to make it easy for performers to give back. So we serve as the conduit between these you know hospitals and, and everything. So, yeah. But anyway, that's that's just a little bit more about my kind of philosophy of of performing and, and what it's what it's given me. And I'm very grateful for it. And that's true because I want I want to make sure we hit the keynote. I want to make sure we talked about win win. We did both of those. I, I have a feeling we may need to do like a round two when the the show drops on Prime or something yeah. like that because there's there's more things I'd love to talk about. But you did tease the the rat story, so let's wrap with that. You're a you're a fledgling <laughs> performer just trying to pursue your your dream in in the uh, in Sin City, and and you've got this you know yeah. set, and all of a sudden you look and there's rats. So please. Grace us with this story of humility. Well, yes, let me please. take it All back. Right. <laughs> sure, let me take it back a bit. I mean, yeah, no, no. So just yeah. to, for some context, I mean, just never – always remember that when you see something, it's not it's not exactly what you think, right? There's more to the it. There's more, there's more hustle. Yeah. There's more hard work. Yeah, I mean, people people walk into a theater in Vegas and they see, you know, I'm up, up on a big stage performing. They're like, man, this guy has it all. It's so easy, this and that. So I slept in my hotel room for many, many years um, at the link and I did not have enough money for a set. I also did not have, the theater wouldn't let me actually have a real set. They, I had like a cage area where for my props. And so I said, if I could fit a set in there, like, can I have a set? They were like, sure, but it's got to fit in there because of like yeah. union rules or they, so I decided that's when I decided to have an inflatable set. So I was like, okay, so I'll make an inflatable set so it can you know deflate and fit in this prop cage. Um, but I don't have any money. And uh, so I crowdfunded a set. So we raised eleven thousand wow. dollars in like two days um, with ten dollar donations. And in exchange, if you donated, you got free tickets to my show and you got to was, sign the set. Oh, that was that was so, brilliant. You you do have the mind of a marketer. Yeah. I got to say that. Continue though. Thanks, John. I just <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so after yeah, so it's one thing to just be like oh rats ate my set. It's like, okay, hold on. Let's just yeah. remember where we're at. I was living in the, my hotel room. I had overcome this obstacle of how to have a set inflated it, reach out to my newsletter, hit up every friend and family member for donations, <laughs> got this thing built, whatever done. And then if you know anything about Vegas, you know that when it rains, now the link, that whole area floods. Mm. And uh, there's a lot of like dirty water that's kind of flowing through there which also means a lot of rats in that like area. And so uh, backstage there was full of construction because there was, it was becoming, the link was becoming the quad and then the quad ended up, or sorry, the Imperial palace became the quad and then the quad became the link. So that whole area was under construction for years. Right. So, and if you know anything about construction, you know, you're pulling up dust and dirt and you know, you're kicking oh, yeah. things up like, and more, more rats. So, um, yeah, we already know the punchline. The punchline is, is, uh, is, is that the rats ate the set, but I remember coming in once and just being like, you gotta be kidding me. Cause now there's like, there's chew holes like all over my set. 
And I'm like, I didn't raise enough money for a patch kit. You know, <laughs> and you're like, what, like, what was I going to do? So yeah, that was, that was one of the low points where I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, but yeah, there were definitely a lot of highs and, uh, and a lot of lows. Um, I injured myself several times as well. Um, you know, which is like, again, it's like being a professional athlete. Yeah. Like it's, that's your life. Yeah. It's such a bummer. Like I had to have, um, surgery. I did knee surgery and shoulder surgery. Mm. And like, I was out for like a year and a half. Now I ended up moving to the Flamingo and ended up getting in a, what was a better room for me and a better time spot. So it wasn't the end of the world. It was, it was best case scenario, but man, it's depressing when you oh, can't, sure. when you're as active as I am a performer and you can't do your thing for like a year and a half. And again, you've got your show and like all of a sudden you're gone and there's somebody else in there and they're like, yeah, yeah. Like when you get better, like we'll find a spot for you. And you're thinking like, will they like, yeah. I hope so. Um, and you're living in a hotel room and you know, you're on, I had one of those little scooter things that the, uh, the old ladies run around yeah, at the yeah. slot machines. Oh yeah. I had a little, little scooter that I was going in and out of elevators beep, beep, because I had knee and shoulder at the same time. So I couldn't even be on crutches. Yeah, that was a, that was a low point. That low point landed lasted for about a year and a half. Yeah, it was a low um, uh, period there. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, anyway. all right. Well, let's so let's do this cause in true uh, Costanza fashion. Let's go on the high note. You obviously yes. saw a lot of cool people in Vegas. Give me your top. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Cool person you met? Performer? Oh, like, I don't man. know. Just tell me something cool. It's like, oh my gosh. So you know what I will say? I will, I will say. <laughs> Donny Osmond is really, really awesome. Donny Osmond is like <laughs> the nicest guy ever. And I had a lot of great moments with him at the Flamingo backstage. He was so humble oh, and he cool. was, he was so, you know what? He was, he made me feel like I had the same problems as he did, even though his obviously were like much bigger in terms of like the business of Vegas and mm -hmm. like the, the decisions we make. Cause he, they were running their business. Donny Marie at the time were at the Flamingo and I was in Bugsy's cabaret, the kind of smaller uh, theater there and he would like plop down on the couch you know and, and and he would chat with me and he'd be like oh man you're so funny i love i love watching your bits like and so that made me feel cool and i remember him talking about like scheduling issues and i'm like yeah i'm not sure like if we're gonna do this corporate and i'm like man those are the same things i deal with obviously the numbers are, are different and the scale the scope is different but um yeah he he was he was super cool um awesome. and always um super kind um, I've had a lot of great experiences with, um, with Emily and Penn Jillette. Um, they've always been, re been really kind. Emily is on the advisory board for my nonprofit, um, mm. which has been great. Um, I love, I love seeing Penn and Teller. Their show is, is just awesome. Um, yeah. And then, and then of course it, there's been some funny, you know, just random celebrities in, in, uh, in, at shows and, um, I actually was just, I just saw David Blaine and funny you mentioned Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito was in the audience and he came up on stage. Yeah. And that's the cool thing about Vegas. You never know, right? He literally, David Blaine yeah. goes in the audience looking for a volunteer and you hear him, you hear him, he like passes by, you know, where I was and you hear him go, holy shit, Danny DeVito. <laughs> and, and, and literally like Danny DeVito is coming up on stage to like oh my pick a card and all that stuff. And it was not, it was not a bit like it was not a plant i mean he's david wow. Wayne is there at resorts world for like months he just yeah. any video just happened to be in the audience so that's hilarious yeah that's the cool thing about vegas is you know you never know yeah you're walking down you're like was that guy fieri like he's going to his <laughs> restaurant like you know anyway cool well look so you got the keynote you've got the the charity so what's a good way like do you like companies, like businesses, churches? Like, what do you like? Someone hears this and they're like, oh my gosh, I got a book. I got a book, Jeff, to speak. Like, what do they do? Yeah. Yeah. My website, jeffsavilico.com. I'm on social at Jeff Savilico on, on all platforms. Yeah. I would say right now I am focused on the, the charity work that I do. So if anybody's interested in getting involved, if you know of any professional entertainers, athletes, celebrities that would like to go room to room at hospitals nationwide, as well as we have a virtual show that we do, we stream out every Monday that goes to, um, a whole bunch of hospitals. So that way, obviously, if you're a sponsor, you want to help us cover costs. There's there's costs associated. Like I said, no performers get paid, uh, but there's still costs associated with running this organization, insurance, background checks for everybody who goes in the hospitals, et cetera. And then as a speaker, as a speaker, MC, performer at companies, association events, that's that's you know how I make my living, so to speak, these yeah. these days while I work on projects like the Amazon special, like the nonprofit, like laughter without borders, taking, taking talents around the world. So if any of those, uh, 
projects resonate with you, drop me a note, connect with me. I'd love to, uh, love to chat. Awesome. And can we, do we know when the prime, uh, show is going to drop? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. So stay tuned yeah, for yeah. that. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> yeah, wink, yeah, yeah. wink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you don't know. Obviously. All right, Jeff. It's been a blast. It's the hour flew by. Like I said, we'll probably do this again sometime if you have a chance. This was been Would love uh, to. it's been incredible. So thank you so much and uh we'll be in touch. Thanks, John. Thanks for listening to today's show. I'm sure you've got some takeaways, and I hope you're feeling inspired and ready to change. Shameless plug here. If you did enjoy the show and are looking for a way to express the gratitude, I'd be incredibly grateful if you left a review. Five stars is ideal, not going to lie, and four stars would work too. If we're looking at three stars or below, maybe take a pass on the whole expressing gratitude thing. All right, enough of the nonsense. Remember, investing inward starts with creating new mindsets, which empower you to live differently. So get out there and go become the person you're designed to be. 